Hello, Brian Miller Hicks here in my continuing series of PowerPoints on Earth Science and Geology. We're going to be addressing meteorology today. Um, what you see in the background is, of course, a hurricane approaching shore. Hurricanes are the biggest, meanest, most devastating storms on this planet, and we'll be talking about those among other uh, weather systems, including very severe weather. Now, since I'm in San Diego, we don't see much of what you're seeing in the first slide. Never get to see that much snow on a roof unless you're way up in the mountains around San Diego. But as you know, weather systems bring precipitation in the form of rain, in the form of snow. And um, this has to do with everything we've talked about so far, heating and cooling of the atmosphere, the circulation of winds in the atmosphere, so the adiabatic effect, the Coriolis effect, the uh, movement of storms due to temperature and pressure changes. Um, so that's what we're really talking about. So we talk about air masses, we're talking about discrete masses of air, which are quite large, many hundreds of thousands of miles in width or diameter, if you will, but with well-defined boundaries. And the characteristics of an air mass are defined by moisture and by temperature, primarily. So if you look at the upper map here, you have what's known as the continental Arctic air mass continental C, Arctic A. Continental Arctic air masses are very cold, therefore they can't hold a lot of moisture, they tend to be dry. Continental polar, um, very similar, but a little bit lower, I'm sorry, a little bit higher temperatures, also cold and dry. So air masses are named after the regions over which they originate. So that would be maritime if they're over the sea, continental if they're over land or continental land mass, with the subset of uh, temperature designation, polar, arctic for cold, um, T for tropical, that means warmer air masses, so you see here, these, this upper slide designates patterns of air masses during the Northern Hemisphere winter. And down here we have patterns of air masses during the Northern Hemisphere summer. In summer, maritime tropical and continental tropical dominate the Southern half of the country uh, with a little bit cooler air up here. But if you notice in the wintertime, the cool and cold air encroaches much farther south than the cold and dry air does in the summertime. Makes sense. Now, air masses don't stay just in one place. They move and they conflict with each other. They collide with each other. Actually, when air masses collide, the contrast in temperature and moisture can cause all sorts of wicked things to happen. Heavy rainfall, storms, thunderstorms, lightning. That often happens when cold air masses collide with warm air masses. And the battle lines that form along their boundaries are known as fronts, cold fronts and warm fronts. So let's take a look at an example of how an air mass is moving and what happens to it as it moves. It starts out in the upper Canadian Alaskan area as a cold, dry air mass. So it would be a continental Arctic with a mean temperature of minus 46 degrees centigrade. That's very, very cold. But then it moves down south, carried by winds aloft and by 
pressure differences. It moves down south. By the time it reaches Winnipeg, it's a balmy, just kidding, minus 33 degrees. It gets all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, where it reaches a high of 10 degrees centigrade, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's still relatively cool, but not as wickedly cold as it was up here. So it goes through a temperature gradient as it moves south. As I've already mentioned, cold fronts, warm fronts, otherwise generally known as weather fronts, these are the boundaries of air masses. So let's look at what happens when a cold front, when a cold air mass here meets a warm air mass here. The cold air mass is composed of cold air, of course. And cold air is more dense than warm air. So the cold air kind of acts like a bulldozer. It bulldozes towards the warm air and starts shoving the warm air upwards along a pretty steep front. This line with the blue triangles is the, is the uh, meteorologist symbol for an advancing cold front. So as the cold front, as the cold air forces the warm air upwards, what happens? Well, the warm air starts to cool as it rises adiabatically, and it condenses into clouds, and the clouds can eventually condense and form precipitation or rainfall. So in a fast moving, advancing cold front, warm air is forcibly um, rapidly rising and there's a rapid formation of clouds and there's heavy rain because of the intense updrafts and downdrafts that form within clouds typical of a cold front, such as cumulonimbus storm clouds. What happens when a warm front in, is advancing? This is a symbol for a warm front, a red line with semicircles. So the warm air rises over the cold air, but it rises more gradually because it just does that, it behaves that way. So instead of a, an abrupt squall line of thunderclouds, we get a widespread formation of different types of clouds over um, elevations ranging from near ground surface on up higher. So we have nimbostratus or rain clouds near at lower elevations and altostratus a bit higher, cirrostratus higher still than cirrus up here. So again, same principle, the warm air is being forced upwards, but it is being forced upwards more gradually. So you get longer lasting rainfall over a period of maybe a few days even, but it's moderate precipitation. This is another kind of a front that we call an occluded front. An occluded front is a front or a combination of fronts that stall. So we have cold air advancing left to right. We have warm air in the center here, and we have cool air on the right side. So the cold air is forcing up the warm air, forming a squall line of cumulonimbus or storm clouds. And the warm air is rising gradually over the top of this cool air here. And then we get the warm air lifting to where it's not contacting the ground anymore. It's just forming a bunch of clouds and raining and raining, and it kind of stalls there uh, because it's not being lifted any more than it is. And then gradually the rain dissipates from the moisture squeezed out of these clouds, and, it, and you have warm air aloft, but we're here on the ground, we don't feel that. We only feel cold air and cool air. Thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are a product of rapidly moving cold fronts 
as we've already noted. They often form in lines of clouds lined up along the cold front. These are typically called squall lines. Now, as you know, thunderstorms can be scary. They produce lightning and thunder, heavy rains that typically aren't, uh, don't last too long, but they can be intense rainstorms for those that period of time. They can also form tornadoes, and that's where they become really dangerous. So a thunderstorm develops like this. You get rising warm air condensing as it gets above the lifting condensation level. You get cloud formation. The cloud grows bigger and bigger. You get updrafts of rising warm air that starts to cool and then sinks and moisture accumulates and coalesces into raindrops. You get heavy rain as the warm air becomes pretty much all cool air. You get just downdrafts, light rain, and the storm cloud is no longer being nourished because there's no longer a, an abundance of warm rising air, and the cloud begins to dissipate, as you see here. This is a thunder lightning storm. I'm not sure where. It could be Colorado. So this is a storm cloud or cumulonimbus up above. Because of the rising and falling air currents and the formation of water droplets and ice crystals in a cumulonimbus cloud, that sets up static electric, electric charges between particles of ice and raindrops. And that builds up into a very massive, intense electrical charge because the earth and the cloud are different polarities, the lightning discharges towards the earth, and lightning can also discharge from cloud to cloud. Um, the, the actual light you see in a lightning bolt is light that's generated by the, um, the uh, energy discharge running through or electrical current running through the gases in the atmosphere, it ionizes the gases to a, to a very high temperature to when to where they start to glow because the gases are so, at such a high temperature heated up by electrical discharge. And the thunder, the thunder clap that you hear is the sound of rapidly expanding gas as it heats up so rapidly. So temperature of a lightning bolt can be very, very, very high, 50,000 degrees or more. So hopefully, um, if you're out in a thunderstorm, lightning storm, you'll take precautions. Don't stand under a lone tree. Don't be on top of a mountain or anything like that. Tornadoes are very, very dangerous storms. They don't occur everywhere. We don't get them much in Southern California. We do get them a lot in what's known as Tornado Alley in the Midwest of our country. How do they form? Well, you gotta have winds, and typically you must have a cumulonimbus storm cloud like it's shown here. So this is what happens. We have winds running along near the ground surface. The winds at a higher elevation are stronger. The winds at ground surface are weaker because there's a component of friction near the ground. So the winds slow down near the ground. That causes air to start rotating, rolling, like a rolling coil or spring, if you will, as the winds develop further as conditions become more unstable. You start getting rising warm air in an updraft. That actually causes this column of spinning air to upend itself, to stand on end as shown here. Now 
you have a massive spiraling flow of air upwards in a very rapidly deteriorating unstable system or situation warm air is coming in from all sides it's flowing into low pressure low pressure caused by spiraling air going upwards so spiraling air going upwards the warm air going upwards rapidly rising rapidly cooling forms very unstable conditions within this thunder cloud and it's being fed by more air coming in so where the cloud grows the spiral airflow upwards grows and causes the development of a very high cloud uh, known as a cumulonimbus which can reach heights of seven miles above the earth's surface this anvil you see here is where the um, pretty close to the top of the troposphere entering the stratosphere get very high fast moving winds up here that cut off the top of a thunderstorm sometimes they can punch through but typically you'll see the flat top that means you're at the top of the troposphere um, where the winds are very speedy so a side of or an effect of this spiraling column of air you see here is it sometimes spins out the bottom starts to form a rapidly spinning cone of air called a tornado so the tornadoes drop out of the bottom of cumulonimbus clouds spinning rapidly now wind speeds in tornadoes can reach very very high speeds upwards of 200 miles an hour along a very tight very low pressure center so this is a tornado just developing this is a pretty well developed tornado it's got a very uh, clearly visible column of air the only way that you can see this tornado is because it's sweeping up dust and debris and water vapor as it spins around and around and that's why you can see it and clearly you can see a tornado column here picking up all sorts of debris plowing its way through these homes these are very dangerous as you well know if you if you're from the midwest you may have actually experienced a tornado so the anatomy of a tornado here's a center again it's a very low pressure center uh, the low pressure centers in tornadoes can be below a thousand millibars 900 something millibars um, you get a rapidly spinning air sucks in debris and it can also spin off mini tornadoes if you will that are called suction vortex vortices so a major main tornado can be a half mile or, or more in diameter these little mini tornadoes can be only 10 meters maybe in diameter 10 meters across about 33 feet but they can cause a lot of damage now this is a map of continental u.s this shows the in, the frequency of tornadoes is the highest in the midwestern states in this region called tornado alley for good reason the most the state with the highest frequency of tornadoes year by year is oklahoma okay then northern texas uh, with some spots up here in nebraska the reason for this primarily is because the midwest is wide open generally flat and uh, plain or prairie country so a lot of times in the summertime you get cold air advancing down from the north and you get a lot of warm moist humid air coming in from the gulf the warm air and the cold air collide clash forming up um, cold front warm front boundaries the battle lines are drawn you get production of many intense thunderstorms 
possibly potentially forming many intense thunders, uh, tornadoes. So the peak days time for tornadoes is actually April and May in the Midwest. Uh, the months with the most tornadoes are June and July, pretty much. Okay. So because of the wind being such a high speed phenomenon, you can pick up debris and ram it into wherever it wants to go. This is a steel guardrail that was picked up and embedded into a telephone pole. Pretty scary, right? And if you live in a neighborhood in Tornado Alley, you may wake up to this sort of damage. It's, tornadoes can be peculiar. They don't destroy everything everywhere. Remember, they can be half mile or so in width, but the mini tornadoes can be much smaller and they can damage only narrow pathways. As you see this path of destruction through here, and it didn't really touch these homes here or here. Okay, now, Hurricanes. Hurricanes are the big daddies of storms here on this planet as we know them. They're the biggest, most destructive, um, generally disastrous storms that we can have. The main hazards, of course, are high winds, but also high water. High water, or sometimes called storm surge, or called storm surge, are responsible for more deaths than high winds. The wind drives seawater up onto the coastline, and it's something similar to a tsunami, and destroys whatever is in its path, and then as it goes back out to sea, it destroys again. Now, hurricanes affect mainly coastal areas because they're generated over the ocean. They're formed over warm water. Warm water is the engine of a hurricane. It derives its energy from warm water. So warm water, very warm water, of course, evaporates and causes an uplift or an uprise of warm, moist air. Typically, the hurricanes we get on the east coast of the US and the gulf coast of the US start as tropical depressions off the west coast of Africa. And as they cross the Atlantic, they build and build and build till they reach the much warmer waters of the Caribbean or the Gulf Stream, where they pick up more heat energy that feeds that converging flow, air rising and air sweeping in to replace that air in a low pressure zone creates these very, very large storms that we know as hurricanes. In Asia, they're called typhoons, but they're basically the same thing. They're also called cyclones, but everything, a hurricane, a cyclone, or a typhoon are the same type of storm. This is Hurricane Katrina in 2005, a very big, a very bad, a very destructive storm that caused a lot of damage to the Gulf Coast that you see up in here, to uh, Louisiana, to Mississippi and Alabama. Mechanics of a hurricane are similar to the mechanics of a tornado, of course, over a much larger area. We get the rising air over warm water. Water is rising, or air is rising spiraling upwards, the air flows out at the top, and it's replaced by air coming in at the sea surface. They get convergence of the sea surface, feeding this low pressure system. And you can also get um, sinking or subsiding air coming in from the top. So this is a huge spiral storm where the air is subsiding or the core of the storm spiraling around the center of the storm, it's called the eye. 
The eye is actually calm. It's a region of calm. But the maximum, the strongest winds are right around the eye of the storm in regions that we call the eye wall. This is a radar image of, I believe, Hurricane Katrina. The maximum winds are around the center of the storm. The center of the storm is an eye. And where you see it very well developed, as you see it here, that means it's a very strong storm. The eye wall wraps around the eye like so. And as you know, in the northern hemisphere, cyclonic winds spiral counterclockwise around the eye of the storm. It's just now hitting southeast Louisiana. Here's Mississippi. Here's Alabama. And here's northern Florida Panhand. So wind speeds can be very high. By the time you get to 74 miles an hour, you're at hurricane speed winds. And hurricane speed winds have been known to develop uh, to speeds of over 200 miles an hour. Where do you get the worst, most destructive winds? In the northern hemisphere, you get them right in here. Because you have the spiraling, rotating winds here at 175 kilometers per hour, which is roughly um, 120 or so miles an hour. But you have to add to that the speed of the wind actually moving the hurricane. So the spiraling winds are 175 kph. And the, the speed of the wind, the speed of the hurricane as it moves is 50 kph. So you add that 50 to the 175 to get a net wind of 225 kph. That's maximum wind speed. On the other side of the storm, on the southwest quadrant, you get the minimal winds because you're now subtracting 50 from 175 to get 125 kilometers per hour. So maximum wind speeds here, minimum wind speeds here. Now 125 kph is still very high wind, 75, 80 miles an hour. So the maximum wind and the maximum storm surge you would expect would be in this region. The storm surge, again, is the water that's being piled up by the hurricane force winds. The hurricane force winds pick up and move seawater as a bulge and the low pressure that develops in the center of the storm also sort of sucks up water. So the net effect is a big bulge of water being pushed, being shoved by the storm towards land. And that, as I said, is quite destructive. Storm surge, surge damage along Mississippi coast by Hurricane Katrina. These are railroad tracks. Obviously, you're not going to build your house on the railroad tracks doesn't belong there. School buses overturn, cars overturn, debris and damage everywhere. And in Katrina 2005, New Orleans suffered widespread destruction, not specifically by the storm surge itself, but rather, I mean, they did get storm surge, but they also got water flooding in from Lake Pontchartrain, which is north of the city. Because New Orleans itself is a city built in a bowl. Its elevation of parts of New Orleans are, New Orleans are as much as 10 feet below sea level. So the storm surge coming in from the south and then Lake Pontchartrain to the north, which had a barrier along it preventing water from that lake flooding into the city. Those barriers or levees broke in several spots, allowing lake water to flood inwards, drowning much of the lower parts of the city. 
that's it for weather systems.